Secret Invasion is a story from Marvel Comics in which Reed Richards and Hank Pym meet Tony Stark, at this time the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., in private in order to deliver him some bad news. Alien shapeshifters called Skrulls have infiltrated humanity and could be anywhere or any one around them. This coincides with many other characters being removed from play as the Skrulls launch a full-on invasion of Earth. Some heroes confront their doppelgangers in the Savage Land, while others do what precious little they can to warn the rest of the world and prevent any further losses. Meanwhile, Iron Man in particular is having his entire understanding of reality crumble around him as a Skrull gaslights him, insisting that he was the linchpin in their whole operation. That, although he believes himself to be Tony Stark, he was actually a Skrull totally convinced of his role in preparing for the invasion. The comic deals with the existential dread of learning that your closest friends and family have been replaced by odious alien forces, the intense mixture of pain and relief at seeing someone you loved return from the dead, and the paranoia of thinking you yourself could have been acting against your own interests for years in order to help enslave the human race and you were powerless to stop it. The show has none of that. Tony is dead, Reed hasn't been cast yet, and Hank is... I know socialism is a charged word, but we can learn a lot. Busy. Marvel's Disney Plus's Secret Invasion is a character study of Nick Fury, a fair and balanced retrospective of his career and the choices that made him the man he is today. It's a story about bridging gaps, no matter how wide or suicidal, and accepting change, I think. It's also a sequel to Captain Marvel, remember that? Oh, it's been 30 years since the Skrulls landed on Earth. 30 years in which Fury and Carol, equipped with a light speed engine and endlessly generous writers, did not find the Skrulls a new home. I knew within a few years of searching that there was no other planet out there for you. Add that to the world building notes, the MCU's space consists of Earth, the Guardian's territory, and a barren wasteland beyond. Forget about moving into an already inhabited planet. You couldn't find an empty world that could support life? What about Thanos' swamp? I mean, garden planet. You have a Skrull who knows its location and can guide you. Oh yeah, Rhodey's a Skrull, by the way. So is Ross. Remember him? That CIA spook from- You can't say that. No, you can't say that. That CIA spook from Black Panther? Speaking of racism, calling him a colonizer now rings doubly cringe considering he was actually a Skrull, a race of peaceable refugees in search of a new world to call home after having been displaced by the Kree-Skrull War. Hey, remember the Kree? The blue assholes from Captain Marvel? They mind-wiped Carol and exploited her for further cosmic conquests before she returned to Earth, learned who she was, and turned the tables on them with her engine slime powers. And despite the Skrulls having started the war, she takes their side, because the green assholes aren't as bad as the blue assholes, I guess. Fast forward to modern day, and the Kree are actively slaughtering the Skrulls while they flee, ambush, infiltrate, and look for a new homeworld safe from Kree oppression. A modern ideological spin on an alien war that's supposed to be just that. War. Two opposing factions trying to wipe each other out for their own gain. Framing the Skrulls as refugees in search of a better life is actually retarded, because not only do we see they have just as much of a propensity for deceit and bloodshed as the Kree do, but they are fucking shapeshifters. Their inherent biological trait relies on deception, subversion, and manipulation. If the MCU was going to frame one of these two species as benevolent migrants, then the Kree are the obvious choice. But they look more like humans, and the Skrulls look more like aliens, and modern sensibilities are all about tolerating everything and everyone in spite of the reptilian red flags popping up around us. Seriously, this may be one of the worst creative decisions in fiction history. Recasting the Skrulls as a race that mirrors humanity in fellowship, intelligence, and range of temperament, and differs from humanity only in appearance, defeats the point of depicting them as goblins at all. All that wasted potential could feed a starving village, and these writers think their take is somehow an improvement on the source material. We're talking about alien shapeshifters, a tried and true concept in horror fiction. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Thing, and They Live all approach the idea from different angles and should have been the primary sources of inspiration in adapting the scrolls to the screen. Besides the comics, of course, but those may as well be toilet paper to these people. The possibility of alien shapeshifters in your midst changes everything. You would need to self-censor 24-7 as not to alert the aliens to your knowledge of their presence. You would need to pretend as though everything is normal as not to draw suspicion from the aliens. You would need to develop a system of codes and signals to communicate with the humans you can actually trust. You would need to run through your routine of codes and signals every time you met your allies because you don't know what happened while they were out of your sight, and you would have to do all of this while grappling with the knowledge that some of your loved ones may have already been captured, killed, replaced, or all of the above for fuck's sake. Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes handle the Skrulls infinitely better. First off, they're evil, because obviously they're evil, they're alien shapeshifters. 
Secondly, Captain America and the Invisible Woman are scrolls for half of Season 2, in which time they were able to surreptitiously influence significant events in order to make ready for the full invasion. It wasn't a faithful adaptation of the comics, because it wasn't trying to be, but it was a respectful adaptation of the Skrulls and the Avengers, allowing for an entertaining original story arc to be played out over a handful of 20 minute long cartoon episodes. It's not that hard, Disney. All you have to do is spend less time shitting on your established names and more time making any of this make sense and maybe you could write a halfway decent story. With a budget of 212 million, we're left to wonder, where did the money go? Certainly not the CGI. It must have been the actors' salaries because they flaunt and squander some real talent here. And it definitely couldn't have been the script writing. 40 in human news, haven't even gone on my midlife crisis shopping spree yet. What you get for yours? The Avengers. Well, you know, I never cared much for golf, so I'm thinking I may take up revenge. The males in my species are very similar. If they're not busy gaslighting you, they're threatening you with murder. That's what all the podcasts are about. Olivia deserved so much better than this. Last time I saw her, she was babysitting Odin before he, you know, and she was incredible in that role. What is she doing here? Shows like these make it impossible to use the term world building. This is a cinematic universe undergoing slow, systematic, and sinister deconstruction. It's like watching Disney play Jenga with a skyscraper. Oh, they got rid of that detail, did they? Oh, they adjusted how that thing works, hmm? What is a rule if not a centuries old piece of architecture just waiting to be vandalized and demolished? Eroding history from the world like it's a sport. So let's assess the damage. Maria Hill, Fury's right hand lady since the Avengers? Dead. Agent Ross and Colonel Rhodes have been Skrulls for years before Thanos' snap and during Endgame's climactic victory and funeral scenes. The Avengers, or at least what passes for superheroes nowadays, are nowhere to be found in this whole show while the entire planet is under threat of alien invasion. And our main character, Nick Fury, is a washed up, incompetent, petulant, depressed fraud of a man. Talos and his wife Soren were taking over for Fury and Hill in Far From Home because, as the president says, Fury was in space working on the most complex aerospace defense system in the history of mankind, aka Saber. That's all we know about it. It's complex and it's in space and Fury left Earth for years to work on it because... Let's just say I had a crisis of faith. The Avengers triumphed over Thanos and retook control of humanity's destiny, thus Fury went to space to mope. They're doing it again, they're taking the thing you liked and humiliating, undermining, and slandering it with a big vindictive smile on their faces. Help me, Talos, cause I am useless without you. Secret Invasion reveals to us Fury's entire infamously successful career as a spy is owed to the 20 scrolls he had working for him while he was pretending to find them a new homeworld. And it introduces a scroll wife he's held in captivity and been neglecting for the last 30 years. And it incessantly reminds us how pathetic and outdated he is by giving at least one anti-Fury rant to a character in every episode. Literally no one, even his closest allies, have any respect left for the man. Maria believed in you. The fury I knew was always three steps ahead. That's the tricky thing with scrolls. They complicate everything from basic communication all the way up to international and even intergalactic relations, which is a reality the writers are unwilling to recognize. Scrolls are conniving, contemptful charlatans. Don't get me started on the hypnotized cows, that's not canon anymore and for good reason. It was only in 2019, post Hadron Collider, that the scrolls were humanized and shown to have interest aligned with that of humanity. Historically, traditionally, fundamentally, they are evil. Humans, I propose a bargain. If you are truly here to battle Galactus, then you will require knowledge that I alone possess. In return for this knowledge, all I ask is that you open the main hangar door. Trust me, humans. Your lives depend on it. My target's down. Fools! You should already know that Galactus has no weakness. Oh, With shut up. I bet you're barren. Although Fury's character assassination came out of nowhere and was not earned in the slightest, he does deserve ridicule for letting any amount of scrolls live on Earth. And not just their agreed upon amount either, Talos invited hundreds of thousands more over the ensuing decades, on top of the alien agriculture Fury would absolutely have a problem with. That thing could be evil too, somehow. 
The show reveals that a million scrolls have been living on Earth for decades now, but we don't see the effects they've had on society or geopolitics. Rhodey is a scroll in the president's ear. What impact did he have that a non scroll wouldn't have had? What policy decisions did he influence that meaningfully changed the course of human history? There are scrolls in governments and media around the world, but it doesn't look or feel any different for it. The fact that gestures, idioms, customs, and philosophies which are unique to the scrolls are nowhere to be seen is just further evidence that they're soulless abominations. They don't create anything, all they do is murder and pillage and replace. The Scroll Council is just as barbaric as the rest. They act like they're cooperating, but as soon as one of them steps out of line, they get punted. These things only know conflict and lies and theft. How could we ever be expected to live harmoniously with them? We change powers. We're gonna be uniquely programmed weapons of mass destruction. Titanium blades! They cut through diamonds! I'm not wearing any diamonds. As a brief side note, it's funny how Rhodey threatens Fury with the video footage of him shooting Hill. Not only because everyone present knows that was Gravik, but because if the footage were fully intact or showed a wider angle, you'd be able to see Gravik transforming or Fury facing off with himself or both of those things. The footage would show a second Fury approaching from a different side of the screen to console the dying woman, but no one acknowledges that. Rhodey's threat is as hollow as the writer's craniums. Additionally, his threat along with the intro's use of AI-generated art raises ideas more substantive than the show is capable of exploring. Rhodey is in possession of video footage of Nick Fury shooting and killing Maria Hill. That is what the evidence shows, anyone with eyes can tell. But we know that's not the truth of the matter. The existence of Skrulls distorts the truth in the show, just like deepfakes distort the truth in real life. Here's an example. So, here we have a fake person using fake evidence featuring another fake person as leverage against our main character. A concept they drop as soon as the scene cuts. And the AI intro is all artifice. It lets Disney save money on hiring animators, setting a very bad precedent for other megacorps to follow, and gives the show the illusion of self-awareness. But all it does is demonstrate how tone-deaf and disconnected the folks behind the scenes are. It is thematically appropriate, but that doesn't mean it isn't also as shallow as the Black Knight's River. Speaking of Rhodey, he was body snatched after his injury in Civil War. Thank fuck, because I just made a video treating him like an actual character in that movie. Meaning that the real Rhodey never got to experience Tony Stank, didn't see his friends and teammates disintegrate and have to live with that trauma for five years, didn't see his best friend sacrifice himself to save the universe, and didn't attend his funeral to mourn with the survivors of that battle. You're telling me this scroll lived through the snap, got to see humans struggle and persevere at their lowest, and helped them bring all the snapped back into existence and didn't warm towards humanity at all? After all that life-altering trauma and intense camaraderie with brilliant, courageous, and dauntless people, he still wants to help Gravik wipe them out. So let me get this straight. In the comics, the Skrulls were seeking a new homeworld because their original planet was destroyed by Galactus. Here, it's because they're losing the war they started. Refugees of that war fled to Earth, and because the Kree who were involved in that 1995 incident were slightly bigger assholes than the Skrulls, Fury and Carol sided with the latter. The Skrulls claimed to be a displaced people, fearing for their survival, and while the humans who trusted them were out looking for a new homeworld for them, their leader, Talos, invited a million more to come to Earth behind their backs. There's your secret invasion, it's got nothing to do with Gravik, he was just a kid when all this started. Talos is the one responsible for putting humans on the back foot. There are no good scrolls. They start wars, get kicked out of every planet they try to inhabit, and lie to even their most trusted allies for their own gain. Interesting, isn't it? A Disney Plus show about ugly, nefarious skinwalkers both waging war on humanity and trying to assimilate into it. I'm thinking of a word. It starts with P and ends with PSYOP. Presenting to Congress for immediate emergency authorization, a bill that designates all off-world-born species enemy combatants. We know how to find you, and we will kill every last one of you. Well, I know who I'm voting for. Till I watched that hateful ass speech you made. And wasn't it beautiful? Now that we've established that scrolls are abject parasites, I'd also like to address how stupid and inconsistent they are. Your name's not Keller. Name is Thanos! What is the point of being a shapeshifter and working undercover if you're going to use the same human form all the time? Scrolls aren't limited to a single persona, and regularly changing skins would help prevent moments exactly like this. The longer we attach to our shells, the less likely we can be identified by humans and scrolls alike. You look identical to the person you're copying. You could pass by simply keeping your mouth shut and your entire species' only redeeming quality is how good you are at subterfuge. Why are you not actively working on improving your soldiers' abilities to assume multiple human identities? Don't you want to live in your own skin? 
There are plenty of scrolls who are very at home in their ivory towers in human skin suits. The whole point of the scrolls is to infiltrate entire planets by impersonating their residents. They should have no problem living in other species' skins. We depend on the goodwill of our hosts. We just have to keep showing them who we are. Yeah, I'm not that big of an idiot. And since when do scrolls have purple blood? Perprician gets shot and we see red. The blood covering Ross's face in episode 1 is red. When Sonya cuts off Brogan's finger, it takes a second for the blood to change pigment, but when she shoots this guy in the leg, the blood that has already left his body is still red. When he and Talos got injured, they struggled to maintain their human form, morphing in and out of it involuntarily, and yet the same thing didn't happen to Ross. But this guy in episode 5 gets domed and his blood is purple before his body even hits the ground. But let's be real, continuity checkers don't get out of bed for less than 300 million. Bro! Whoa, he has a Hulk arm! Yes, he's got the- <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. To be clear, the Super Scroll is a single character. A supervillain who has the powers of all of the Fantastic Four. That's it, nice and simple. But the gluttons at Marvel just couldn't help themselves. Look at all these references, all these callbacks to the foundations of the MCU which Phase 4 and 5 take so much joy in pilfering. Nearly every Avenger spilled blood in the battle of Earth, even Carol Danvers. How? Literally fucking how? Thanos with the fully kitted Infinity Gauntlet could not make that battle axe budge. My face when I realized the incestuous decline of this franchise has reached the point where bad writers only have other bad writing to pull from. It's not like they needed to add fuel to the fire. They didn't need to turn Phase 3's power creep into a power avalanche. They chose to scrape out all this memberberry residue for one last blustering blowout. The Harvest is a vial containing the blood of every Avenger, which Fury decided to store in his own tombstone, conveniently right outside Russia, which is accessible by a strong breeze and in the wrong hands has the capacity to subjugate the entire planet. And if you're wondering about the efficacy of any single Avenger's DNA now that it's contaminated by and mixed with all the other DNA in there, don't. Stop thinking entirely, you might actually enjoy Secret Invasion that way. The thing that I tried to do was really manage my expectations because that's one thing that I've realized really dampens uh, my level of enjoyment. This show has no idea how much damage it's done by introducing a DNA bank for the Avengers. What this meant before was that the Super Scrolls have the capacity to copy and paste side characters' enhancements on them by standing in a big thing. With the Avengers DNA readily available for that, oh boy, might as well just have a garage sale. The Super Scrolls, characters invented for Secret Invasion with names misappropriated from superior works, are now the most powerful entities in the MCU. Besides maybe this thing, but be honest, you didn't watch this movie. From the blood of other MCU characters and creatures, they were able to assume and immediately understand how to use the powers of Groot, Captain Marvel, Abomination, and Ghost. Remember Ghost? Yeah, they're that desperate for keys to jangle at you. But not only that, jangling intensifies, when Gravik and Gaia use specific characters' powers, they also bear distinct visual traits that could not possibly be transferred through blood, but which do allow viewers to recognize the pandering more easily. Oh my goodness! Oh, he gets to be Groot! Ah! Oh! Mantis! <laughs> Mantis! <laughs> <laughs> so we're just shouting out the names of the characters whose powers they're using. Mantis! Oh! Oh! Hulk's leg is accompanied by torn purple pants and Mantis's empath powers by glowing antennae, as if those things are inextricably tied to their abilities. When invoking Ebony Maw's telekinesis, his limp wrist and rings come along for the ride, so why doesn't Thanos' arm have the Infinity Gauntlet on it? $212 million and they don't know how to play Jenga without setting the house on fire. Show's over. It was a great end. It's a great end. That was great. That was fantastic. That was so that, that, that actually leads right into the marbles. What can be said about Gravik and Gaia? The new blood. The boxes to be ticked. The failed attempts at innovation. The confused, bipolar, and spiritless husks that coast along on their status as either a real-world celebrity or the obligatory villain of the show. When it comes to character, I can't comment on what isn't there. In episode 1, Gravik puts a lot of sugar in his coffee. In episode 3, he has this interaction. I like a little bit of espresso with my sugar. Set up and pay off. If, if their thought process was, we're going to replace men roles and add some female empowerment and some female characters, that was a very tasteful way of doing it. 
With Gaia, there's a bit more to unpack, partly because she actually survives the show, but mostly because she's the latest in a long line of dragon ladies who Disney wish could be as cool as the men who preceded them. But unlike the heroes of old, these women are simply horrible. Captain Marvel stole a guy's bike, destroyed a small business's jukebox, and slaughtered thousands of Kree she fought alongside the previous week with no regard for whether they were being manipulated like she was. The Scarlet Witch enslaved an entire town to roleplay as a happy family with her prosthetic husband and imaginary children, and threatened to destroy the multiverse if she could not steal children away from another version of herself. She-Hulk. Just as Loki was actually a show for Sylvie, Hawkeye was actually a show for Kate Bishop, and Moon Knight was actually a show for whatever her name is, and just like Disney is actually a CCP front, Secret Invasion is actually a show for Gaia. There are lots of trends like that you pick up on, and by now you don't have to look very hard. In episode 1, Gaia gets the dirty bombs from Propretian. Talos stops her before she can get away and tries to appeal to her humanity, with both of these doorknobs ostensibly forgetting scrolls don't have any humanity. This is also when Gaia learns that Gravik was responsible for her mother's death, which does not sway her allegiance to him. All she does is mark the bomb so that Fury and Talos can identify them on their way to being detonated. After the explosions, Gaia looks sad despite participating in everything leading to this. What is it with Disney girls being incapable of doing anything wrong? Gaia was a terrorist who aligned herself with a genocidal alien until his plans affected her directly. Suddenly, all is forgotten. Here, have 20 movies worth of superpowers in a bottle and a contract for a solo trilogy. I will use you, and you will use me, and together we'll make this planet safe for both our people. They somehow managed to make a character with more power and less personality than Captain Marvel. What is the lesson here? That if you regret your past mistakes and are angrier than the villain you're working for, you'll win? Why is it that Disney projects can't elevate female characters without derogating men? Why does Fury take all the blame for not finding the scrolls a new home when Carol is the one with light speed powers and experience traversing the stars? Why did they even need to find the scrolls a new planet? There's plenty of space on Earth for immigrants to populate. They already did this with New Asgard, and don't get me started on that the Earth is overpopulated bullshit. This is the MCU, where half of all humans on Earth can suddenly reappear after a five year hiatus and the planet keeps spinning without so much as a hiccup. Falcon and the Winter Soldier tried to show the consequences of people being displaced by the blip, but they didn't go nearly far enough in showing how catastrophic such a population explosion would be on Earth's infrastructure. So, based on all available evidence, housing one million scrolls on Earth, separate from the real people, is totally plausible. Not saying it'd be a good thing, just that the writers are uncreative hacks. Take for example, the final episode's twist. New Skrullos is a massive compound deep in irradiated Russia where the Skrulls gather and live and scheme. Their immunity to radiation makes it an ideal living space far away from potential witnesses to their atrocities. Besides the Russian government, which would absolutely know about them, but never mind that. And humans' vulnerability to radiation means the Skrulls won't be bothered short of an orbital bombardment. So when Fury took some iodide pills and walked right through the gates of Chernobyl, I had to pause in confusion. Was this the writers pulling another stupid, thinking that it's meaningful, or was this the misdirection I called after seeing episode 1? These people cannot fathom how shallow and predictable their work is. I've seen the thing. I know how the looming sense that someone is not what they appear to be can be used to create tension and provide surprising, impactful developments. That's not what Secret Invasion does. Scrolls pretending to be main characters and other scrolls should have been happening every episode. The layers of mindfuckery could have been insane. We could have seen Gaia, disguised as Talos, talking to one of Gravik's lackeys, disguised as Gravik. The mere possibility of that would mean it would actually be important to remember things that characters say to one another, and to keep track of events that only some characters would know about, and to look for distinctive tells or body language that might give certain characters away. But this show thinks you're way too stupid to even follow interpersonal dynamics as complex as an episode of The Bachelor. And it thinks that with such conviction because the writers themselves are so... limited. I sent three operatives to infiltrate the Royal Navy. Time to change. They were looking at photos of the people they're replacing. The three of them inside the car are not the same three who exit the car. We were just told they're on a mission to do shady scroll shit. No scroll worth their salt would be caught dead saying aloud, time to change. One moment the show will spoon feed you information as though you have the memory of a goldfish, like when we were reminded twice in the span of a minute that the bombs would be marked by infrared paint, and the next it'll expect you to accept whatever just happened on screen as though it doesn't shatter immersion, like the fact that Rhodey has no evidence against Fury that would not simultaneously reveal the scroll invasion if made public. Did you take a stupid pill with your breakfast this morning, Admiral? This sudden reframing of Rhodey as one of Gravik's underlings is gross. 
Don Cheadle's been here for 13 years, but because of the snap and blip, Rhodey has been around even longer and this is what they're doing to his character? Undoing the past decade of his effect on the world so that he can be a poorly implemented twist villain now that the other MCU heavy hitters are dead or on hiatus? Sad. Secret Invasion gave me hepatitis. Besides the multiple character assassinations and utterly forgettable plot, this show is just full of really dumb shit. Amelia Clark is a beautiful and charming actress, but they dress her in baggy, unflattering clothing and give her all the emotional depth of a Moai head. <laughs> Gaia and Fury's wife, Priscilla, end up in a shootout in episode 5, the stakes of which are eradicated by the fact that at this point in time, Gaia is a super scroll. She could have wiped them out single-handedly, but the writers were approaching the climax and hadn't hit their designated girl boss moment quota yet. The series begins with Prescott finding out that Ross is a scroll, but there was nothing to prompt that revelation or the ensuing fight. Their conversation reached its natural conclusion, and it's as if Prescott was signaled by the director to start some shit with no justification for the scuffle in-universe. The show has a serious problem with how it handles death. The murder of Maria Hill was supposed to establish a precedent. That no one was safe and anyone we cared about could die here. That there are real stakes. But all it signified was that Kobe Smulders was smart enough to jump ship as soon as she could. Gaia's death is baited at the end of episode 3, but firstly, she wasn't interesting enough for me to care leading up to it, and secondly, I knew immediately that they would bring her back in the next episode, like that one final wet fart you're waiting for before pulling up your pants. Talos actually did die, but I didn't care, his body is left in the street to rot, and he's never mentioned again. I forgot he was even in the show by the finale. During World War II, Nazis practically destroyed this area. Brixton became a haven for immigrants from the West Indies. Is that why you chose this place? The path of struggle is steep. I feel a lot of strength when I'm over here. These are not scrolls. These are some weird cosmopolitan immigration metaphor. Disney either couldn't afford the makeup for every scroll in every scene, or they just didn't trust the audience to be able to remember characters in their scroll form. A little insulting, but based on the behavior of their diehard fans, I can't fault their logic that much. There is not one case of a character actively trying to determine whether the person they're talking to is an imposter or not. Everyone takes for granted that the character they're interacting with is the genuine article. No paranoia, no rewatch value. The Widow's Veil technology has existed for over a decade, and Fury doesn't think to use it, putting himself that much closer to matching the Skrull's capabilities, until he needed to get through customs in Episode 5. The fact that this technology exists is itself a problem for Secret Invasion. Intelligence agencies around the world would either be actively using it or have contingencies and countermeasures in place for it. You can't introduce groundbreaking disguise technology and expect us to believe in the same universe as the Sokovia Accords, world governments crossed their arms, furrowed their brows, and just accepted that they're not worthy to wield it. After Fury's done chewing out the president for what he should have done 30 years ago and he's about to return to space, Priscilla shows up out of the blue to join him, meaning that Fury knew full well how much danger she and every other Skrull would face moving forward and was going to leave the planet without her. I mean, I would have done the same thing, but by this point the writer should know better than to depict Fury acting in his own best interests. Fury and Talos have a frenemy dynamic going on throughout the show, but all this means is that they act like children and refuse to cooperate with each other until the plot needs them to. And the sheer gall of the writers to use this line... The least you can do is not rewrite history when this show is explicitly a retcon of Nick Fury's history. Explaining his time in space as a years-long depressive episode after winning against Thanos, attributing his success as a spy to alien immigrants he was exploiting for work, and introducing a wife he's had in secret for decades only to tell us he was an awful husband the whole time. You didn't start ascending the ranks until me and 19 of my people signed on as your invisible spy network. You think Fury's hiding something? He's a spy. Captain, he's the spy. Another line that is aged like dick cheese. Shooting guns. Last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. Oh, mother and the cherry on top of the cake. After the climactic fight in New Skrullos, all the people who the Skrulls captured in order to replace are freed in the middle of what is effectively a city-sized microwave. Even if they weren't getting their organs fried by the very air they're breathing, why should I care that they're free now? The blip had no effect on the world, why would a million people returning to their lives from captivity? But at least Rhodey's back, yeah, until Armor Wars has him upstaged by Riri Williams and I'm forced to weigh the potential gains from covering it against the potential losses of being called a bigot for having the pattern recognition skills of a high-functioning chimp. Even children can tell all is not well in Disneyland. 
I used to be interested in the MCU, even its initial decline, but nowadays it's physically painful for me to watch bad media. I have a soft spot for superhero fiction, so those types of videos won't go away completely, but moving forward I will be a tad more selective in what I cover. Especially when it comes to Disney. I have no idea what Marvel property I'd cover next, but the upcoming Avengers farce is the safest bet. It's just so tiring watching the same formula get played out across the industry over years. Out with the old and in with the cringe. The MCU is the secret invasion going on right under our noses. The future is dommy mommies and milk toast men suppressing their testosterone all the way to an early grave and I'll be damned if I'm gonna let the shills go unchallenged in the discourse. All scrolls are evil, thank you and good night.